Welcome everyone. The title of today's webinar is Gender, Sex, and Midwifery, Oh My, <laughs> um, Creating a Gender Affirming Community. Um, thank you all so much for joining this 60 minute presentation, which will be followed by about 30 minutes of discussion um, and time for questions. If you are calling in today, please be sure to mute yourself um, during the um, presentation portion because um, it's harder for us to do that than if you call in through the computer. Um, we organized today's webinar in the Equity and Midwifery Education series to provide us with an opportunity to collaborate and learn from one another as we seek to implement change. We also hope that you will join us for future webinars and calls. You can find out that information at www.equitymidwifery.org. Um, and a big thank you to the Foundation for the Advancement of Midwifery, who provided a Community Movement Builders grant to support the speakers in this webinar series. And without further ado, I would love to introduce our presenter, Indra Wood Lucero. Lucero, of course I did it wrong, even though I practiced. <laughs> Indra is a reproductive justice attorney and entrepreneur. If you'd love to switch the slide, Indra, that would be great. Who founded Elephant Circle and the Birth Rights Bar Association. Advocate for policy change that supports families and physiologic well-being. They are also a staff attorney for National Advocates for Pregnant Women as a gender queer Latinx parent, they are committed to creating a world where all worlds fit. I'm so grateful that you're here with us and I would love to turn it over to you. All right, pleasure to be here. So one of the reasons I start with this slide is not just to actually introduce you a little bit to who I am and where I come from and what I do, but also to highlight a couple things. First of all here, you have me on your screen in two ways here, but the image of me in the picture and on the video. What we have here is a person who has given birth and a person whose gender can be read in multiple ways. Certainly, since we're talking about me here, I can tell you that this particular being has been read as male, female, and as, I don't know, um, so I just wanted to sort of ground our conversation in uh, this touchstone of, first of all, my, my own personal embodied experience, and also this, this very normal human experience of trying to interpret somebody's gender. And usually what we're, we're, we're doing when we're doing that is we're perceiving their gender expression. Later in the presentation, we'll talk about the difference between gender identity and gender expression and biological sex. But one of the things about gender expression is it's the part that's on the outside. And you can't always tell what's on the inside based on the gender expression. So even though, you know, there are certain signals of a, at least in our culture, in contemporary United States that are, are sort of signaling a masculine gender expression like the tie and the button-up shirt and the short hair. Those signals don't tell us much about um, either gender identity or biological sex. Um, so I just wanted to sort of start there and also a lot of folks get hung up on the use of the singular pronoun they and so I wanted to provide an example to you of, of how singular they can be used. Here it's used in my bio. Um, they are committed to creating a world where all worlds fit. They're also a staff attorney. Um, so just here we have some examples of how you can tackle that tricky singular they. It's actually not so tricky. Here's the overview of where we're headed in this webinar. We're going to talk about why are we even talking about this? We're gonna dive a little bit into history. We'll tackle some definitions and some key concepts, get into some best practices. This is really oriented toward best practices for providers. And then we'll talk about how and why you might wanna be an ally or a champion. So diving into the why. I have several sub sections for why which has to do with, you know, this is what midwives do, gender is culture, gender intersects, discrimination happens, and young folks are birthing. But let's start with the midwives model of care since this is a webinar for midwifery educators. 
this is really, I think, particularly important and relevant for midwives because midwives already know how to do this. This is already part of the midwives model of care, which recognizes the benefit of psychological and social well-being, which recognizes the benefit of individualized care. And that's really what this is about, especially when we're talking about best practices for working with transgender, intersex, gender non-conforming, gender non-binary folks. We're really talking about providing that psychological and social well-being and individualized care. But I also, of course, wanted to underscore that when we're talking about creating a gender affirming community, we're not at all talking about eliminating women or subordinating women or removing women from their very important place in the conversation about uh, birth and reproductive health and justice and midwifery. So of course, I have here in the bottom right corner a yay women sticker. So another reason why this is important is because gender is culture. Whether, whether or not we're even talking about transgender, or gender non-binary, or intersex folks, even if we're taking gender to be a binary, which of course it's not, even then, gender is, is culture. It's, it's not uniform. It's not homogenous. People don't recognize gender all in the same way across culture and time. And that's one of the things, you know, I've certainly learned from this picture of a stack of books here in the background, which is, you know, just taken from my library. And I think that's very useful to keep, keep in mind when we're talking about the importance of addressing this issue, specifically as it relates to midwifery care, it, is just it's, it's a good humbling reminder to know that even if we long to be able to talk about a uniform group that's called women, there's really no such thing. There's no such uniformity. Uh, not everybody agrees on what it means to be a woman. And certainly over, um, you know, much scholarly effort, no one has arrived at, at a consensus about what it means to be a woman. Um, I also think it's interesting to note, as this study from the Williams Institute found, that adults who identify as transgender are actually more racially and ethnically diverse than the U.S. general population. Um, I don't have a conjecture really as to why this is, but I think it's interesting just to note that not only are we talking about gender as culture, um, with regard to different ways people perceive what it means to be man or woman, but um, there may also be racial and ethnic underpinnings to that, and certainly there are. Related to that, it's important to address this issue because gender intersects with everything else. You, you know, we are many things. We're certainly not only our gender, um, and not only are we not only our gender, we're not only our race, we're not only our class, but the way that we are, our race and our class and our ethnicity and gender, all intersect, they're all interconnected. It's really hard to tease apart each of those things. So when we're talking about gender, of course, we're also talking about the intersecting layers of how, inter, how gender inter, interfaces with these other components of our identity. This is also important, especially in the context of reproductive health care providers, um, because discrimination happens. Um, it's important that we tackle these issues, address them, talk about them, because the reality is, as this slide says, um, in a recent survey of 6,000 transgender folks, 19% uh, reported actually being refused care. I think this is really quite extreme. 19% actually going to a healthcare provider and being told by that provider, I'm not gonna help you go away. Um, of course, in that same survey, as a result of this kind of discrimination, 28% postponed care. Of course, that has significant implications for people's health. 
25% were harassed or disrespected. So I think of refusing care as being on one extreme. And then there's the folks who are, you know, sitting there, quote unquote, being given care and being harassed or disrespected while they're receiving care. And 50% reported having to teach their providers about how to provide them with care. So this is important um, because it may be if, if you're serving someone who is transgender or someone whose family member is transgender, they're gonna have a particular relationship and expectation when it comes to healthcare providers. Many, many of them have experienced discrimination. Another important why is simply that young folks are the folks who are birthing. Um, this recent survey of California youth, age 12 to, to 17, of course, these are folks who are going to be birthing. 27% of them identify as gender nonconforming. 50% of millennials think of gender as a spectrum. And um, this isn't so much to do with young folks, but in the population as a whole, one out of every 100 people have intersex characteristics. So the reality is, is that these issues are issues that the folks who are giving birth are facing. Just like gender is culture, uh, history. History is culture and there's no uniform singular history to, to gender um, and in fact, Throughout time and across cultures, uh, gender has been experienced and perceived in multiple and different ways. Uh, in the background of this slide is, of course, you know, a, one of those cool timelines with lots of different layers, way too detailed for us to see um, just in one glance like this. But I, I have it in the background to underscore and, and reinforce the idea that when we're, we're talking about gender and thinking about it, you know, I couldn't possibly in one hour present or convey all the different ways that different cultures have figured out gender or thought about gender, and especially not across time and through history. But the main point being is that in fact, gender has been thought about differently across time and throughout history. So the fact that, again, in contemporary uh, 21st century American culture, there's a notion of gender as being a binary, we can just know that that's, that's not universal, that's not necessarily the foregone conclusion and natural state of things, that it is cultural, it is located, it's in a particular time and space. There are variations. I do refer at the bottom of the screen to this um, great PBS documentary about two-spirit folks in indigenous communities. That's just one example, but I think it's a, a compelling and interesting example and a good film. I think also especially relevant to this issue when it comes to midwifery is the history of obstetrics and the role of Western medicine and obstetrics in developing what we come to experience as, you know, contemporary 21st century notions of gender and sex. I recommend this book, Hermaphrodites and the Medical Invention of Sex. Um, I found it very informative. And what, what I learned is as obstetricians were professionalizing in the turn of the 19th century, um, there were a lot of advances in how obstetrics was done. There was more capacity for, you know, learning more about anatomy than had been done before. Um, and one of the things that was happening during that time was a lot of attention was paid to figuring out atypical anatomy. Um, and what the folks, which included doctors and scientists of the day, came to understand is that biological sex did not neatly line up with gender presentation or gender identity. They would be 
dealing with folks who were presenting as women and they would come to find had anatomy of what they understood to be men um, and vice versa. So this, instead of using that, you know, sort of information, that data that they collected about these differences and coming to define or think about gender as, as non-binary, the scientists and doctors of the time, of course, mostly white men, came to figure out ways to reinforce gender as a binary and to constrain the use of that data so that it would just mainly protect the binary definitions of male and female. Also during this time, there was a development of, oh, sorry about that. Um, at, this, at this particular time in history, sexual orientation was really conflated with gender. So folks were, if they identified as gay or if, if they were male-bodied people who were attracted to male-bodied people, the idea was that they, what they truly wanted was to inhabit a female body. Or if they were female-bodied people attracted to female-bodied people, the idea was that they just really wanted to inhabit a male body. Um, and then if there were bisexual people, the idea was that they truly wanted to be in the language of the day, a hermaphrodite. Contemporary language for that would be intersex. Um, of course, now our understanding of sexual orientation has shifted and we've kind of broken it out from uh, biological sex and gender identity. We no longer think that if you're gay, that just means you want to be a woman. Um, but if we think about it 100, 150 years ago, that was definitely the predominant view. And of course, homosexuality was considered deviant as well as these, these um, biological variations. They were similarly considered deviant, but it was just starting to move into this period of time where that deviance was seen as not so much a moral failing, but a medical condition or a psychological condition. Needless to say, the, the, the underlying thrust of how it was dealt with, these scientific advances and discoveries, had to do with power. And the folks in power wanting to preserve and maintain their power, and the folks who otherwise didn't have a voice continuing to still not have a voice in, the, in these definitions and these advances uh, around gender and, and biological sex. So I have some quotes here on the screen, one from the book I recommend, the other, a more recent quote from Cheryl Chase, an intersex activist, who points out, and I think this is just very important, that intersex is humanly possible, but in our culture, socially unthinkable. I also refer you to a couple articles at the bottom of the screen. This one, a recent story about a midwife who took it upon herself to save babies who were born and, and had some sort of anatomical difference that, that deemed them to be, in our, our language, intersex, but in her culture deemed them to be not worth surviving. So the, the typical approach to handling these babies would be that they would, they would be killed. And this particular midwife took it upon herself to save them. And then there's an interesting uh, article about a case in the United States of, of a family who fought their babies receiving gender reassignment surgery um, early in their life. So if you get interested in these issues, I think those are both worth looking up. Here are some, I think, useful definitions just to help you as we proceed to the next part of the webinar. Um, these are mainly definitions related to biological sex, um, but just so we're on the same page, when we're talking about genitals, those are external organs of reproduction. When we're talking about gonads, 
Those are internal. Those are an organ that produces gametes, usually testes or ovary. Chromosomes are nucleic acid, acids and proteins. So this is also internal. Hormones, another internal chemical. Um, secondary sex characteristics, these are things that are external, um, but don't usually develop until puberty. Sex assigned at birth is a way of talking about the biological sex that's indicated on official records at birth. And this is usually just based on a visual examination of genitalia, so it usually doesn't have to do with any information about gonads, chromosomes, or hormones. And then just to distinguish sexual orientation is, as we understand it today, a person's sexual identity in relation to the gender to which they are attracted. But a further note on words. I like this quote from Jorge Luis Borges um, that just reminds us that language isn't actually a fixed thing. It's not something where there's a right or wrong answer. Ultimately, it's a dynamic living force. Um, and so for that reason, I tend to not provide definitions for every word that I use, for everything that I say, um, partly just to reinforce the reality that we can't possibly just learn all the terms. This is not about a practice of learning the right words. This is much more a practice of learning that there are words that people use and they might be different from words that you use. Um, so the reason that I don't necessarily define all the words that I use is to just remind you that it's impossible. It's impossible to know all the words. I don't know all the words. I, I often use words that I even know don't work for some people. For example, the word queer. I, I use that word. That word works for me. And I know it doesn't work for some folks who are otherwise similar to me, but maybe from another generation or a different cultural experience. So, um, but to the extent that you are interested in particular uses of words, I also recommend GLAD's glossary of terms and their references for how to, how to use language. Now this is, this is really fun. This image comes from National Geographic's issue that was dedicated to gender. Um, I believe it was January 2018 now, so it's, it's been maybe a year and a half. But what we see here is basically the uh, key to an image that I'll show you in the next slide, which will show pictures of folks. And this key is just showing us what terms um, the folks in the picture use to identify themselves. And where I want to begin is just to notice all the different words that folks use. Um, it's not just like there are three terms or four terms even. There's a bunch of different terms that folks use. And here's now the picture. So in looking, and of course you can move me on your screen so I'm not, I'm not blocking your view of this image. What I think is particularly interesting about this is that when you're glancing at this group of folks, you know, I certainly don't know who identifies as a trans boy, who identifies as intersex, who identifies as uh, cisgender. I don't know. You can't know. We don't know. Um, partly because that is gender identity. That's what is inside of folks. And only they know how they identify. Um, and the other thing I think is interesting about this is it shows that gender expression, which is the outside part, can look a lot of different ways. And how people express on the outside can mean different things for how they express on the inside. So again, here's the key. Here's the key. So just take a look and notice the different, the different words. And again, here's the picture. 
So let's dive into this a bit more. Here are some key concepts. There are three components that I really, I really hope that you will understand. The difference between gender identity, biological sex, and gender expression. So again, this image is from National Geographic as well, and it, I think, just does a great job of breaking these three down. At the top, you'll see gender identity. I have the orange arrow pointing to it. It's represented by this little uh, rectangle on the inside of someone's mind or head. Um, and that's because it's representing, the graphic image here is representing the idea that gender ide identity is something that's inside you and it's an idea. Um, but certainly this gender identity is represented also on a spectrum from woman to man and non-binary non in between. Uh, it's, it's folks can identify or have that idea inside themselves on this range, on this spectrum of things. Then in the middle represented in the green lettering are things related to biological sex. Biological sex also is not on a binary. In fact, in humans, uh, there's, there's quite a range when it comes to uh, biological sex characteristics. Again, represented on the image as these uh, rectangles, including things like Adam's apple, breasts, body hair, sex development genes, and internal and external genitalia. So again, biological sex itself is not a binary. There's female, there's intersex, and there's a, a wide range of ways one can be intersex, and there's male. And then finally, represented by this turquoise color, and that's emanating around the body in, in the image to sort of indicate that external facing part of ourselves. Gender expression too is not on a binary. There's feminine gender expression, there's masculine gender expression, there's androgynous gender expression, and a range of things. So when I talk about this, I, I often get folks who are kind of going along with me. Yeah, I get it, I hear you. There are these variations, but Let's just get real when we're talking about pregnancy and birth, we're talking about reproduction. We're really, we're really talking about a binary, right? And while there is some truth to that, indeed it does take two different components in order to reproduce, the reality is that those components don't necessarily exist in, in, in tidy alignment with gender expression, gender identity, or even biological sex. And so I, I use these images from this great children's book called What Makes a Baby, which I also recommend, to remind us that when we're talking about reproduction, when we're talking about even the, the binary components of reproduction, we're talking about certain organs, we're talking about certain components, like you can see in these in these images. Some people have sperm inside them, some people have eggs inside them, some people have uteruses inside them, but not all the people do. Some people don't have eggs inside them, some people don't have a uterus. And the reality is, is that is the case regardless of somebody's biological sex, gender identity, gender expression. There is in fact uh, quite a range of diversity when it comes to even sperm and eggs. And so I find that it's helpful to be reminded and think about that. And that can actually be really useful to folks, not just transgender folks or intersex folks. That's, that's true about cisgender heterosexual women. They don't all have eggs. They don't all have uteruses. And so the more that I think we can talk about reproduction and really talk about what we're talking about, I think it can really be healing and helpful and clarifying for everyone. I also refer to this blog at the bottom of this slide, um, and it's the story of an intersex person who was pregnant. So some folks just um, can't even conceive of somebody who's not biologically a female being pregnant, but 
here's one person's story. So again, this brings us back to that question of, okay, this all may be true, but who can give birth? And so I've put circles around that image just to reinforce, again, anybody with any gender identity, well, any gender identity may be somebody who can give birth. Any gender expression may be somebody who can give birth. And somebody could give birth who has the biological sex of either female or intersex. So now we can start to think about best practices. Um, this slide I enjoy partly because of this, this image is actually from a play in the late 1800s. And you can see she's wielding a knife here. Um, but this is around the same time that some of these scientists and obstetricians were discovering atypical anatomy in some of their patients. And one of the stories that really struck me from the book, um, Hermaphrodites and the Medical Invention of Sex, was a story of somebody who had lived their life understanding themselves to be a woman and was eventually told by one of these doctors, but my God, woman, you are a man. And I think that's a really, you know, I can imagine that that woman may have felt some, something like this woman from the play. She may have felt rather angry and astonished and disbelieving of this doctor's insistence that she was a man because as far as she knew, that was ridiculous. Similarly today, I hear folks talking to masculine presenting folks, masculine presenting folks maybe like this person pictured here who may have been pregnant, may have given birth and being treated like, but my God, man, you are a woman. And I just think about, you know, a hundred years ago. And in fact, neither then nor now, does it feel good to have somebody tell you that you're not who you think you are. Um, and especially if that's a, you know, a healthcare provider, someone, from whom you're hoping to get some help. So as a general rule, best practice is to take folks, you know, seriously when they tell you who they are to, to honor, at the very least honor their understanding of themselves. It's really important to providing good care. It's certainly very important to listening. When it comes to being a provider, there is some, some great work being done by the folks at the University of California, San Francisco Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. I realize I have a typo here. It is UCSF, um, but that's correct in the link. When it comes down to it, the current recommendation is that providers just use this two-step set of questions. Number one, what is your current gender identity? And number two, what sex were you assigned at birth? And this is just a, an easy, clear cut way to address the information that healthcare providers need. They need to know, they should know both the current gender identity and what sex people were assigned at birth. When it comes to best practices, a lot of folks want to know how to use language. And my recommendation as, as an approach, as a strategy, is to talk about what you're talking about. And then I have this symbol here, sort of a stop sign. If you don't know what you're talking about, perhaps you should pause. At least pause, maybe stop, um, and kind of try and check in and figure out what you're, what you're really talking about. And, and for starters, a lot of times this comes down to, oh, are you conflating biological sex and gender identity and gender expression? Or is there a way that you mean to be talking about one of those three and could then get some more clarity by focusing on biological sex, for example. Noting, of course, as I've noted here in, in the, in the um, columns, 
Even if you're talking about gender identity, it's not a binary. Even if you're talking about biological sex, it's not a binary. Even if you're talking about gender expression, it's not a binary. So if you find yourself wanting to talk about a binary, you may need to you know, double check and see where that binary is coming from. Um, so again, there's some reminders on this slide about what each of those three things mean, but I do think we can gain a lot of clarity by, by being more specific about what we're talking about. And I think it's a good rule of thumb um, when folks are wondering how do they approach language. I will say that another way that folks often ask me about language is wanting to talk about sort of wanting to do a forward looking, future looking um, reference to folks. Um, so people ask me questions about what to put on their website, what language to use in materials or forms. Um, so in that sense, I think it's also helpful to talk about what you're talking about. If you are talking about the biggest possible group that you can imagine serving, then I recommend using the most broad terms. So you might find a term like the term folks that is not gendered, that, that you know, forms the biggest umbrella. But if you're talking about folks that you already do serve and you've only ever served people who identify as women, then you might want to use the term women um, because you're talking about a known quantity or a known entity. I find this comes up at work here at National Advocates for Pregnant Women. We do use the term women and that's because Generally, we are talking about the people that we've served and the, the people whose legal cases that we're working on. And so far in, in our documented um, thousands of cases and in our documented caseload, the folks that we are serving are women. But when we talk more pros prospectively about who may be impacted by um, criminalization of pregnancy, for example, we might need to use the term people, pregnant people, because we're talking about the, the universe of possibilities and the universe of possibilities is certainly larger than the known quantity. Um, so again, knowing what you're talking about and talking about what you're talking about can be a good guide in figuring out best practices of how to use language. Another good strategy is to ask open-ended questions. I've listed some on this slide. Um, questions like, tell me about your previous healthcare experiences. Now that we know that trans and gender nonconforming folks face discrimination in healthcare, it can be really useful to ask a question like this. Um, how do you describe your gender? You know, you don't even have to have a multiple choice list. You can just ask folks an open-ended question. Just tell me how you describe your gender. Tell me what pro pronouns you'd prefer. What do I need to know about who's going to parent this baby? What terms do you prefer I use for you or the other people who will be in this baby's life? Um, also a question I love is just anything else, anything else I should know. What I love about the practice of asking open-ended questions is that it's good for everybody. Um, it won't just benefit transgender or gender non-conforming folks. There will, there will be other families whose, whose circumstances get crystallized because you've asked an open-ended question. You may learn things that you otherwise wouldn't have learned through just a checkbox or a multiple choice kind of situation. So again, as midwives, and I think as midwife educators, you already know a, a core piece of how to do this and why to do this. And that is for the psychological and social well-being of the folks that you care for and for the value of providing individualized education, counseling, and prenatal care. Who people are matters to them in terms of how they receive their care. And on this slide is a picture of me 
with brand new, just born baby. This is over 16 years ago now. Um, but here I am in a very classically beautiful midwifery model of care moment of having just given birth surrounded by folks and surrounded by folks who I felt understood who I was and understood how I understood myself and were very supportive of that. Going beyond best practices, going beyond understanding why this is important to think about, I think that there's room for women in particular to be allies and champions for transgender people in particular, and certainly vice versa. And that's because, you know, society controls the bodies of women and transgender folks, sometimes in similar ways. And I've, I've used this chart to, to demonstrate that both women and transgender folks deal with education issues, deal with um, employment and deal with intimate partner violence. So there are lots of places and ways and reasons that the issues women are dealing with and the issues that transgender folks are dealing with can be connected and that, you know, we can really be allies for each other. We can work together. We have reasons, certainly, to work together. Re, you know, restating that transgender people and women experience inequities. And of course, it's very useful to know the difference between a disparity and an inequity. And I think it's particularly meaningful to think about this in this context. If we're thinking about reproductive health care, they they, there may be good reasons to have a disparity between the kinds of care women get and the kinds of care transgender people get, because sometimes they need different kind of care. Um, and a disparity is just a, dif a difference in a measure between populations. But an inequity is a disparity that's the result of systemic, avoidable, and unjust social and economic policies and practices. Um, and we know that for both women and transgender people, and certainly intersex people, there are those systemic and unjust policies that have, you know, created the conditions where there could be denial of educational opportunities, discrimination in employment, and increased rates of violence. Here's a good example of the allyship that I'm talking about. Um, this group is no longer active, but you can still find some information about them online. This is a, a community of masculine, of center, women, men, two-spirit people, trans men, and allies committed to changing the way that communities of color talk about gender. Um, and this message here, I think, is particularly important. We believe that by investing in the lives of feminine-identified people, especially women, girls, and trans folks, we will shift the balance of power. Um, this is, I think, not uncommon amongst trans communities. The trans communities that I know and have been a part of are all very aware of the power dynamics and the importance, in particular, of investing in the lives of feminine identified people. Um, so I put this here also to really challenge the notion that some people raise that by talking about trans issues, it's somehow part of an agenda to erase women. Um, that is certainly not an agenda that I have ever been a part of or aware of. I, I think that is not a real thing. And I think it is, in fact, a symptom of a sort of transphobia, you know, a fear of the, the fact and the reality of the non-binary and uh, a desire to maintain binary because of what it provides for and gives to folks who benefit from the binary. Actually, I wanna note one more, one more thing when we're thinking about you know, who benefits and why 
why we might be aligned and should be champions and allies for each other. 11.9% of women receive infertility services. 16% of women do not give birth. So we may even be better allies to each other to, you know, women may be better allies to women by really recognizing the ways that not all women's experience of, of reproduction or reproductive health or their own reproductive experiences or bodies are the same and really making room to disconnect certain components of reproduction from gender or even biological sex. Of course, I also really recommend just being a lifelong learner. In this short time together, um, you know, we can't possibly cover it all. So if you get interested, just, you know, Google some things. I have here some ideas. I've tested these phrases. Uh, I know that some good stuff comes up when you put these things in. Um, but of course, as with any online search, just remember to check the source, understand this, you know, who is the source and why they made what they made. I also recommend this masculine birth ritual podcast listed at the bottom of the screen. And that really brings me to the end of the, the content that I've created to present to you. Um, but I think at this point, if we can open it up to questions and conversation, we could, you know, delve more deeply in whatever direction you'd like to go. Thank you so much, Kendra. Really, I'm glad I got to experience this twice because it's just, you've just done a really great job. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. And I would like to open it up. Um, I think folks were so engaged that people weren't putting questions in the chat box. <laughs> and so I don't have anyone to call on, but I'm guessing that some of you out there may have some questions. Jenna, it, there you go. She's got it in there now. Um, why don't I unmute you and let you ask your question? Or you can unmute yourself, sorry, <laughs> if you know how. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, Indra, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I just typed my question in. Um, and yeah, I'm wondering, the birth community that I'm a part of in my region um, is very um, cis, heteronormative, mainly white, all really loving and sweet people, um, but just not uh, super knowledgeable or even um, realizing that gender and gender identity is something that needs to be talked about. And so I'm wondering what strategies or suggestions you might have to like convince these folks that this is an issue that needs to be discussed when they might not even be seeing it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that of, of course is what makes it particularly hard. If somebody has no lived experience to kind of root this issue to, you know, I empathize that it's, it's hard. It's hard to, you know, care. So the question is kind of like, how can you make, somebody care about something that they don't know about um right you know my strategy throughout my life has has been to you know to try and tell stories tell stories to as many folks who i can get to listen you know in in my past i've been a performance artist partly for that purpose um i think what i found is people tend to be quite interested in people telling their own life stories so you know, possibly having a panel or, you know, a community event where you could have a panel of, you know, even three different folks telling their life story. And you may, in certain communities, you may have to bring some folks in from another community because that community is just too homogenous and or the people who aren't are too scared to speak out in that community. Um, but I think that can be a good place to start and actually can be something that can generate 
the folks who are inside the community and maybe have different experiences to, to be a little more comfortable talking about it. Mm. Um, you know, like I shared things throughout the webinar that I thought could be those kind of conversation starter points. Um, if you did a book group or even just an article group that could read some of those things that might be, might be cool or listen to that masculine birth rituals podcast. Even if you just, you know, again, had a group where it's like everybody listen to the podcast and then we're going to have a discussion. Even just doing that one time can kind of like get, get the conversation going. And, and the other thing I'll note is it just takes time. It takes time and it may feel like you're doing nothing and seeing no progress for even years. Um, but that is, it, you probably are making a difference by even the conversations you're already having. I, I, my hunch is that you in fact really are and it's just taking time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then I think our next question, Lauren, would you like to go? Yes, hi, thank you very much for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, my question was if you might be able to provide some examples of supportive, thoughtful questions that midwives could ask their clients who don't identify as cis women. Yeah. Sorry, I've got a noisy baby. <laughs> Uh, if they don't identify as a cis woman, uh, to allow us to better understand their history or maybe their their care needs from us. Well, I definitely think that question, let me see, um, you know, what have your, what, how, <laughs> where is that question? And one oh. thing I can say for you, Indra, is the resources I put together from the presentation include those open-ended questions on it. So just so you know, people will have access to that as well. Great, great. Actually, that slide's exactly what I was looking for and I was just distracted. Oh, <laughs> Thank okay. you very much. Oh, okay. That's what it was yeah, so yeah. starting with that, tell me about your previous healthcare experience. Um, and that's even the kind of question that you can kind of even ask a few times. Like you may get that first answer, you know, I myself have had this, I, I would be very cautious to say much. The first time a provider asks me this, I'd be kind of like, okay, well, that's cool that you're asking me, but do I trust you? I might need to be asked that same basic thing a few times to really get to the deeper levels. Um, so I would keep that in mind in asking those open-ended questions. They might be worth coming back to, especially in the midwifery model of care is such a beautiful way and opportunity to do that, you can just kind of build it into your practice that you ask certain things upon intake, but then you ask them, you know, at the third appointment and, you know, sixth, you, you return to some of these open-ended questions. Great. Thank you so much. Annie Koontz, I believe you had a question. If you'd like to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, so so my question was about um, letting um, possibly pregnant trans folks in the community know um, that I'm open to working with them because there's definitely been um, some providers in this area that are not wel welcoming to transport folks in the community. Um, so I guess I'm trying to figure out, I mean, I understand about, I think it's great having these questions to ask once they're there, but how do I, um, I guess, let it be known that, that I, I do want to be working with trans folks that want to have the option to have an out of hospital birth. And, and also, I guess, piggybacking on that question. Um, no, I lost my train, train of thought. So <laughs> let's leave it there. Sorry about that. It may come back to you. Um, well, I think first it's good to think about your accessibility to folks on two levels. One is just that, that first level of your awareness that there are people to be served and your 
wanting to say, hey, okay, you who may have been discriminated against, you have, who may have sought care and actually been refused, I'm going to be one of those people who doesn't refuse you care. Um, but then there's this deeper level, you know, maybe I would call it a more substantial and more advanced level of, of care, which is where you're somebody who is actually quite um, expert at providing care to that population. Maybe because of your own personal experience, maybe you can identify, you know, maybe you're culturally congruent or maybe you've developed that expertise. Um, so for that second, that deeper layer, um, first of all, it's important to know that there is such thing as really being able to provide that deeper level of care that really can culturally congruent or at least um, um, culturally skilled kind of care. And there's no, you know, there's no special signal or symbol or a phrase you can use to indicate that. Um, but what comes from that is people will know, people will resonate and respond to your ability to pro provide that kind of care. And essentially then that's not a marketing issue because um, you're, a lot of times you're involved in the community, you're part of the community, and that's how folks know. But maybe if you're just starting out, you, you don't have that level of expertise, you don't, don't have that level of familiarity with the community, but you'd like to build it, you'd like to, you know, be known as somebody who, who at least won't reject folks. Um, in that case, there are some things that you can do and start to do and maybe even just invest in doing over time. One of them could be using some language in your marketing materials that would just signal or flag, um, I'm a safe provider. You could, you know, use things like trans affirming, literally you could say that I'm a trans affirming practice. Um, you could say something like LGBTQ friendly, uh, you could even have a little that you could put on your market materials or your website, a trans flag and or in addition to, uh, you know, what's recognized as like the lesbian and gay rainbow flag. Um, so there are, kind, there are ways to kind of signal that you're friendly, certainly the kinds of images that you present in your marketing materials or on your website if you present images of folks who you know, don't just express their gender in one way, that's another, that's another way. But again, it's just also important to keep in mind that if you're on that first level, you may not yet have all of the knowledge um, that another provider who's more expert may have. So you also want to just be honest about your limitations. You know, I once went to a therapist who, you know, advertised herself as being LGBTQ friendly, but when I got to her office, I found that I was having to educate her on a lot of things, and that felt like a little bit of a, you know, I, you know, although sincerely, I, I appreciated that she recognized my community as one she wanted to serve, but then I felt a little disappointed that she didn't have the level of expertise that I needed as somebody who was seeking a care provider with expertise. So, I know that was a lot. I hope that answered your question and maybe you thought of your follow-up question. Um, if, I, if I have a second, I, yes, that was extremely helpful, especially to talk about the differences between like being open to it and really having expertise, expertise and being prepared. Um, so I'm working on a training with um, a trans man who's, who um, has done training for healthcare professionals and so I feel like I'm kind of in the beginning of this journey, so I appreciate you delineating the difference, and I think that's important for me to really internalize and think about and, and think about where I'm at before I start, like, really marketing myself that way, because I wouldn't want to add to the kind of experiences that you, you just described. Um, and I guess my follow-up question feels kind of like a reversal as well. Um, I work with a lot of very conservative folks, you know, folks coming from Mennonite communities and folks um, in military communities where they're um, often very um, conservative politically or, um, you know, I work with some other religious um, areas that are very, very conservative. And, you know, I've, I've had actually a, a husband cross out all, all the words partner 
in all of my documentation and write in husband before. And so um, I'm trying to figure out how to be accessible across the board. And, and that's a hard thing to do because I don't want to um, cause offense to anybody, but it's also critically important for me to be a safe space for all sorts of folks, especially folks that are, you know, disenfranchised in general. Um, so I, I guess, I mean, that's a big question, but like walking that line, um, and I understand that like, you know, sometimes people are not going to like you if you're going to be willing to do this kind of work and, um, and that's okay. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm sure there's no real happy medium, but if, if, um, anybody has ideas on how to address those conversations that, that might be helpful. Yeah. I mean, you're right. It is, it is a big question and it isn't something that you can like, there's no magic way to succeed at making everybody happy, certainly. <laughs> but I think a way, a pathway toward, you know, being as accessible to as many folks as you can is something like the open-ended questions. Of course, that relates a little more to forms and process for things like intake. Um, but I've found in my experience talking with, you know, new families, is, you know, using language like family, tell me about your family, um, supporting families, new families, is, you know, a lot of people feel comfortable with the, with the term family, um, especially as a queer, genderqueer person starting a family. It felt very empowering and cool when people or providers acknowledged my ability to be a family-making person. Um, and yet I think it's not alienating to conservative folks. Um, as opposed to having a form using language that then somebody might cross out, either, you know, somebody who really wants to use the term husband or somebody who really doesn't, you know, having blanks, it, you know, is one approach. Again, that's not going to remedy everything or your entire question, but that's where I think it comes also back to the value of the midwifery model of care, you know, really having a way of providing care that's rooted in attending and valuing the people who are in front of you is a great skill. It's not a skill that every provider learns or has. So don't, don't lose sight on just the basics that you already know. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Is there anyone who's on the phone who has a question or who hasn't indicated in the chat box that you'd like to ask a question? You can unmute yourself and ask. Hi, I have a question that piggybacks on what you were just talking about. Um, I'm just wondering if, I, I mean, I take a note of all the resources that you have. So I'm, I'm partly wondering if you have any more resources that would provide guidance in particular to midwives on providing care for midwifery clients. Um, and then also mixed with that is I'm, something that I've been wondering about for a while is kind of balancing those open-ended questions um, with wanting to get to know folks um, versus what you were talking about um, asking someone to really like teach me how to provide you care because I don't want I don't want to make somebody feel that way um, but I also like I'm 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 new to this and I'm genuinely curious and I'm wondering if you have any advice about balancing those. Hmm. First with regard to resources um, I don't know yet of you know some sort of great guide written really for midwives that incorporates a lot of stuff that would be relevant for caring for queer transgender folks i don't think that exists yet still when i last checked certainly i actually do know some folks who have it in mind so i wouldn't be surprised if something like that exists soon so maybe stay tuned um, I do want to mention there's also the Queer and Transgender Midwives Alliance. Um, there's a Facebook page for that group if you 
if you might be interested, if you might be somebody who identifies as a queer transgender midwife. Um, and also that's an entity that's looking to, I think, create some resources in the future. So maybe stay tuned there. Um, and then with regard to your question of kind of like, how do you, how do you do that dance between asking open-ended questions and not making folks feel like they have to teach you how to care for themselves. Um, and again, I just say, I feel like midwives do a good job of that. My own personal experience getting care from midwives, I felt like just the model, the way that the midwifery models care reinforces the, you know, wide range of normal, um, reinforces the value of, of the person, the, the client receiving care, being involved in that care. I think that's a lovely balance, you know, the, the midwife providing expertise and experience based on what they have expertise and experience in, but acknowledging all the things they don't. You know, I really felt for my, my midwives, and I don't know, maybe, you know, how do you midwives do this? Capture the, you know, somehow you're able to convey that birth is something that you know and it's something that's familiar, but also this birth you've never seen before. Um, I think it's that spirit that is that gets to the heart of your question. And you can even embody that as it sounds like you're a, maybe even a newer midwife. That's okay. That can be part of what is true. Um, you know, I know at, at my kiddo's birth, as pictured in one of the slides, there was a, at the time an intern midwife there. And I loved how, how much of a, you know, new young midwife she was, that really like her excitement and her newness was part of what she conveyed. So I think it's okay, you know, to be you, be honest about where you are in your journey. You do have expertise, acknowledge that, own that, and um, just value people. I know it's kind of like that it's oversimplifying and also super complicated. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, that was really helpful. I also just thank you so much in your presentation for like pointing out not needing to learn the right words, but just knowing that there are other words. I think that was just such an important reminder for me. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Thanks. I have put some things in the chat box. Um, Indra, if you think any of them are terrible, you'll let us know. But okay. the first was there is a page on birthforeverybody.org for that lists some resources for providers. Um, and then there are, I just started with this first four, um, you know, scholarly peer reviewed articles, um, but there are more. And so I will try to at least get a few of those onto um, a resource list as well. Um, for, Cause we usually do a follow up resource list from these calls, so. Perfect. Is there anyone else who would like to unmute yourself and be able to ask a question? Um, Karen, is that, are you wanting to ask a question? No, no question. Just kind of wrote about one of the things I help students with their writing a lot and, um, and working on trying to, to do the right thing. Yeah, is there anything more you, you want to say or? Mm -hmm. Probably not more than what I wrote in the chat box. I guess along those lines, just um, again, I, you know, I don't think any of us should think that we've learned it all or figured it all out. I certainly don't. Um, even when it comes to my own self, my own identity, um, I keep, you know, I keep growing and evolving and being pushed and challenged. Um, and I think that's like, 
that's sort of the goal is to be in a state where we actually can withstand the the challenge of being dynamic the challenge of being not fixed um i guess you know obviously this isn't you know directly the subject of today but an underlying thing folks are talking more and more about especially care providers is trauma informed care and certainly trauma whether it's you know as a provider your own experience with trauma or as somebody who's seeking care your own experience of trauma 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 certainly narrows us and limits us trauma makes us less capable of being able to withstand challenges and withstand in you know insecurity essentially so I think part part of this conversation needs to be a recognition of the role that trauma plays. Um, when you bump up against those points, whether it be in teaching or in providing care, where you kind of get the sense like this person can't be can't be pushed on this, can't can't be challenged on this anymore. There might be an underlying trauma issue there that's that's actually the thing that's going to have to be resolved before any, you know, bef before that person can, can have an experience of just being like open to more possibilities. And that's just, that is normal and okay. And at different moments in our lives, we're going to be more capable of dealing with more <laughs> dynamism that other times we just really have to narrow it down. Um, so I think just, I, I would add that if our goal ultimately is to always all be lifelong learners, what are some of the things that get in the way of that? Trauma is one of the things that gets in the way of that. So we want to keep that in mind. Looks like we have another question. Hi, um, I have one more question. It's about um, gender culture that you were talking about. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, in institutions that we're a part of where gender culture and the like norm of like the binary norm show up, how do we like transform the way um, in which we're seeing gender culture come up and like manifest our desire to be free in these institutions that we operate in? I mean, <laughs> there's definitely not a simple answer. You know, I think one thing that folks who who maybe present as cisgender or have, uh, you know, aligned gender ide identity that aligns with their gender expression can do is just challenge some of those impulses to, to make the group called women uh, seem more homogenous than it is. Um, you know, with some of the, even some of the details that I've mentioned, you know, well, 16% of women don't give birth or 12% of women receive infertility services, you know, just, well, that's, you know, 20% of folks is, is a good portion. Cautioning, you know, just that impulse to overly homogenize. Um, I also think trying to institute practices in whatever group or organization you're in um, where you kind of like force yourselves to have a somebody come in with a different viewpoint again maybe it's something like doing a book club or a reading group or an article thing um, because one of the things we know just from like um, human behavior and and cognition is that humans are really just oriented toward us them um, dynamics that's just how our brains work and one of the things that we can do especially in an effort to bring about equity is is challenge that just notice when we're doing too much us them and have some sort of way of breaking out of it i think you know lifelong learning is one of those ways we can break out of it challenging anytime anybody thinks they have all the answers um you know as a as a leader in your group uh, you can you can be the voice to, to sort of humbly offer well I certainly haven't figured it all out yet but you know here's where I'm coming from today using language that essentially creates more possibilities even when it's not related to gender 
that can help, you know, shift the culture of where you're at. And then, of course, interfacing with or having some sort of experience with people who are different, you know, watch the PBS um, documentary about two spirit folks or listen to the male birth rituals podcast. Um, I think some of those that are stories are particularly useful as opposed to articles, but of course everything's got its place. Um, I know that, I know that that's just kind of like a tip of the iceberg answer to your question, but that's where I'll, that's where I'll leave it for now. Thank you. Is there, we're kind of running up towards the end of our time. Is there any, you know, kind of final burning question that must come out <laughs> before we... Am I coming through okay? I can hear you. I okay, see great. you. Great. All right. Well, again, Indra, thank you so much. Um, I really am so grateful um, for your time um, and all the work you've put into this. Um, it's, it's really helpful and important. So thank you. My pleasure. Um, and actually, I'll just even note as a sort of like closing uh, remark, you know, I've been working on this for decades. This is my entire life, life's work. So it's not like I was even able to put this webinar together. This is, you know, a multi-draft kind of process. So just in terms of your own journey, give yourself time. It's okay to be on the journey. It's okay to take time. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good reminder. Yeah. Um, and, um, for the rest of you, we would love, as always, um, your any feedback you have on this webinar or any ideas to share for the future. Um, we also hope you will attend future webinars and calls, which you can find out um, on the website, as you know, equitymidwifery.org. Um, our next call for midwifery educators, just a reminder, put it on your calendar. It's summer, I know, but it could just be, you know, 90 minutes to plug in, um, and that's gonna be on Wednesday, July 24th. Um, again, at this 2 p.m. Eastern time, and that'll be a syllabi work group. So um, you can bring just yourself, you can bring yourself and your syllabi, you can bring your ideas to share, um, and you can just be present um, for some ideas about um, how to, um, you know, incorporate um, some of these important ideas that we cover in our webinars into your um, curriculum um, and your syllabi. Um, and so we'll look forward to that. And then I'll keep you posted about upcoming webinars as well. Um, remember, any previous webinars are available to watch on our YouTube channel, which you can find linked from the bottom of the website. Um, some of those um, CEUs are available for um, through Hive CE. Um, and you can always ask me if you can't find it and I can help you um, through the contact page. Um, Kristen, should I stop sharing so you can put your screen back up oh, sure why don't we go ahead and do that yeah thank you great um and then um i will just go ahead and and show it so folks can see um here um and just a reminder as well the website is huge if you haven't explored it um there are many many pages layers um that you can explore as you're trying to work within your institution um uh, to um, promote equity um, in midwifery education. So lots of lots and lots of resources to work with. Um, and then if you didn't see in the chat box, there is um, a, uh, all of the things that were mentioned in Indra's presentation, I provided links to the various videos and whatnot. And you can find that by going to the webinars page. Um, and I'll also send it out in an email, but here it is this little PDF where it says related resources. And so this is everything that Indra mentioned today. Um, so if you'd like to be able to access, and I did include those open-ended questions because I just thought they were so great um, as well. So that is there for you. Um, and again, um, just um, thank you so much um, to Indra and to all of you for participating. Um, thanks for being here. My pleasure. 
All right, we end our recording. <laughs>